Uh, so welcome everyone to this, the second offering of our Ask the Expert Q&A sessions. I'm Jeff Beach with Cystic Fibrosis Canada and uh, joined by my colleagues Ian McIntosh and Devin Sherman and several others uh, behind the scenes. We're very pleased to be able to offer you this uh, opportunity to ask questions and listen and learn from questions coming in from others uh, with some members of our uh, CF clinical community. Um, so just before we officially get underway, uh, a few points, I guess uh, you could call it etiquette in terms of the, of the Zoom system and the teleconference uh, type system we're using today. All participants are muted with the exception of myself as the moderator and the panelists. This is to avoid any unnecessary noise and distractions in the background. I can't guarantee that there might not be any from my end. I have two young kids. Last I checked, they were watching a movie and seemed quite happy, but that could change. Uh, we went through the challenges of working from home. But um, if you do, and I, we do encourage people to submit questions uh, live today, please send a message through the chat feature in Zoom, uh, which will go right to the panelists. And Ian is going to uh, be collating those and feeding those questions in. Uh, we did have questions that came in in advance, and we had lots of questions that came in in advance of last week's session. So. Uh, reminder again, this is the second in a series of Ask the Expert sessions that Cystic Fibrosis Canada is hosting this month. Last week's initial session featured Dr. Val Waters uh, from SickKids Hospital and Dr. Ann Stevenson from St. Michael's Hospital, both in Toronto. Uh, that session was recorded and is available in the COVID-19 section of our website, cysticfibrosis.ca. So I would encourage you, if you were not able to join us last week, or if you were and you wish to view the session again, uh, it will be saved there and will continue to be saved there along with this one and others as we add to this series going forward as we build the uh, online library of resources for the CF community around COVID-19. Uh, for today's session, we're going to try not to be too repetitive. A lot of the questions that are coming in are still um, uh, along similar themes. So there might be a bit of uh, message, messages that we're trying to uh, reiterate, I guess but we'll try not to be too repetitive in terms of the, the types of themes that were covered last week. And again, we encourage you to avail yourself of that Q&A session that was recorded. Uh, please do submit questions, as I said, through the chat window as, they, as, you, uh, as we proceed throughout the session. And even afterwards, continue to submit them through our social media channels or through email, uh, because we are offering this as a series and we are building a Q&A section online, which is updated literally every day. So keep the questions coming and uh, we are here to help during this time. I also want to remind you, speaking of help, that we do have an information and, refer and referral rather service that is available to you all the time, whether it be COVID-19 related questions or any other matter pertaining to cystic fibrosis. And you can always reach us through either email advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca or you can call our office the 1-800 toll-free number is 800-378-2233 we are not physically in the office or any of our offices across the country at this point due to COVID-19 but we are checking messages regularly and someone will respond to you to help you get the information and support that you're looking for uh, on an individual basis if you wish to contact us. So having said all that it is my pleasure to welcome our experts for this session. As I said last week, we are so fortunate to work with an outstanding team of clinicians from across the country at the 42 cystic fibrosis uh, clinics across Canada. And we're very grateful to have two of them join us today to share their expertise and answer questions coming in from the community. So today we welcome Dr. Ranjani Somayaji from the adult CF clinic at the University of Calgary, Alberta and Dr. Mark Chilvers from the Pediatric CF Clinic at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. So perhaps we could just start, uh, Mark and Ranjani, if you could just take a moment to introduce yourselves, and then we'll get going with some of the questions that are coming in. Ladies first. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Ranjani Samayaji. I'm an infectious disease doctor, and as Jeff mentioned, an adult CF doctor in Calgary. And uh, I'm uh, Dr. Mark Chilvers. I'm a pediatric respirologist uh, out here in uh, Vancouver and the CF Clinic Director at uh, BC Children's Hospital. Good morning, everyone. 
Great. Thank you again, both of you, for joining us. We're uh, very pleased to have you with us. So uh, I want to remind everyone that these sessions are not intended to provide specific medical advice. We encourage you to please consult with your CF clinic uh, physician and clinic team with questions regarding your own personal health care circumstances. Having said that, uh, sometimes people's specific questions are, are good examples that can help others. But if you have very specific questions that require medical advice, we do ask that you please consult with your clinic as you always will. Uh, so we'll kick off with um, maybe having uh, you both, uh, Ranjani and Mark, maybe you can just take a minute to let us know how um, things are going with your clinics, how you're managing through the pandemic, and uh, how you're continuing to be in touch and providing care with your patients during this challenging time. You want to start west to east? But, okay, so the, um, with everything that we're uh, doing with COVID-19, we're wanting to minimize uh, interactions uh, for, our, for our patients with the hospital and the healthcare team. And so we've canceled all uh, elective uh, clinics and we are doing virtual uh, clinics uh, either through uh, the telephone or through uh, virtual health to look at, uh, to review our, our um, uh, patients and so with uh, with that that seems to be working well we're also uh, uh, piloting a program to do virtual cough swabs so cough swabs and sputum samples will be couriered to families to take samples from their children and that will then be dropped off to life labs and processed here so they don't have to come into the uh, the clinic Anyone who's acutely unwell will be is triaged by the nursing staff and then if they need to be seen then they're seen at, in a isolation room at the children's hospital. The change, we normally do to, uh, infection control with uh, gowns and gloves, and with the addition now of a mask and face shield, which is the slight difference uh, for, for our patients when they, if they were to get seen in the, uh, in the hospital. The other thing, uh, um, we've also tried to minimize any um, elective admission and if children need to be admitted and the same precautions um, and um, we're also updating the clinic letter to the family to uh, update them as, uh, with, on COVID-19 as this is really a moving field and it initially was changing hour to hour and day by day and now I think uh, across Canada, things are getting well prepared and well planned. And I think uh, it's now a little bit more stable. Over to you, Ranjani. Okay. Um, so I think a lot of what we're doing in Calgary is quite similar. So we also have moved um, in our adult CF clinic to virtual clinics. Uh, we do keep them. Uh, we've moved most of them to Wednesday mornings. Um, but we are available by phone and email and pager at all times uh, if anybody needs to get a hold of any of the CF clinicians uh, or the nurse practitioner that works with us. And then on Wednesday mornings, if there is a patient that needs to be seen urgently, we can accommodate that in a clinic space. And I think the infection prevention protocols would be uh, similar as to um, what Dr. Tilbers already mentioned. And then in terms of anybody that needs to be admitted, uh, we would arrange it similar to what we always do in Calgary in terms of a direct admission to a bed um, with the appropriate infection prevention protocols in place um, and also the uh, unit that they're admitted to is still away from where patients with confirmed COVID are. So again, that gives us spatial uh, separation as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both of you. How, um, we're getting some questions from the community around um, specifics and as to whether there have been any confirmed cases of um, COVID-19 uh, in, in, in the CF uh, population in Canada. Are you aware of any uh, such diagnoses at this point? So I have, I mean, in terms of the contacts that I have uh, in Canada, in the US and Europe, uh, there have not been any cases that I have heard of. Um, and again, and this sort of addresses the, is there a risk to CF patients as well? And I think ties into that. And I think part of it um, doesn't actually mean that there isn't a risk to patients with CF, but it also probably 
indicates how good people living with CF are at isolating themselves, hand hygiene, cough hygiene, and protecting themselves in general. And I think the that was one thing that I was concerned about at the start of the uh, pandemic. Um, was the impact to patients with cystic fibrosis and I uh, uh, and from um, Spain and um, that has uh, that from uh, contacts there there have been uh, five or six adult patients with cystic fibrosis who've been infected with COVID-19 and one pediatric uh, patient and from what my understanding this was not a significant impact on um, their underlying health uh, certainly it didn't need intensive care admission from what I understand although data is, is limited and from my perspective, looking at the literature, certainly in the pediatric population, this is a viral infection. And so the common things for uh, minimizing the risk of viral infections is the social distancing, hand washing, and then if you are sick is the isolation. And then what we've been doing in clinic is if a children who develop a wet cough, who've got a viral uh, um, symptoms, we tend to do the cough swab to see if there's any bacterial infection and then treat according to the cough swab. Thank you both. And, and Mark, uh, your video has cut out a little bit. So I, I thought maybe it was just the reception on my end, but I'm hearing from Ian that uh, it seems to be cutting out a bit. So uh, it seems to be okay for the moment. I know sometimes these um, calls can be a bit unstable, so hopefully we'll be all right. Uh, did you did you hear? Were you able to hear my answer, the, my voice? Yes, we could hear most of what you said. Although I am going to actually move into a question now. In terms of, I know you you mentioned um, uh, and it was cut off something about the situation in Spain, uh, but perhaps uh, you could comment uh, on what you're seeing in other parts of the world and uh, protocols that have been taken. I know some have. Uh, like in the UK, uh, declared people with cystic fibrosis to be uh, quote unquote sheltered uh, patients. Um, maybe you can comment on what you're seeing and if there's anything based on those protocols that uh, people with CF in Canada and their families could learn from. Yeah, Th thanks. Uh, hopefully, you can see my video now. Is that working? Seems yes, to be good yeah. Now. Yeah. perfect. So, yeah, I think that was one of the things which I mentioned is that we, I saw that information from the UK about uh, patients with cystic fibrosis being sheltering. So, I reached out to my colleagues in the UK about that because that was quite a dramatic uh, move with that. And so, the feedback I got fr um, from them was uh, initially for the adults, patients with CF, some may have quite significant lung disease, so low uh, FEV1, and that's why that recommendation was, um, was made. And they were comparing that with patients who were immunocompromised, who had severe um, emphysema or COPD, and that's where that recommenda recommendation came. And then that was causing a lot of confusion. And so they then made it for all patients with cystic fibrosis, just so that the um, messaging was uh, the same and didn't cause cre uh, confusion in the community. And I don't know if it picked up on my earlier uh, comment, but it, in the UK, there've been six adults with cystic fibrosis who had COVID-19 and one pediatric patient. And from uh, the information I was given, that this was a relatively mild uh, infection and didn't need um, intensive care admission uh, with that. Okay, thank you. Ranjani, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I think he's covered it. Okay, so a lot of the questions that we're, we're seeing uh, coming in uh, over the last week or so, and, and certainly leading up to last week's sessions as well, are around protocols for isolation and precaution and so forth. Uh, so for example, one question that came in, I think today or yesterday, was from a, a person that, that has cystic fibrosis whose partner is considered an essential uh, worker. She, uh, she or he uh, works in a, in a bank, uh, so is in contact with a lot of people in the public on a daily basis as they're still having to work. Um, so the question is when the partner 
uh, comes home from work, uh, what can they do to make sure that that person who's working is not bringing anything into the home? Is there anything that you would advise that could help people in that sort of situation where one uh, person in the home is living with CF and others are ha having no choice but to be out working in, in the public? And uh, obviously that's of, of heightened concern for people right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I think probably many people, whether they're living with cystic fibrosis or not, potentially face this challenge. And I think there was a similar question asked last week as well, and uh, Dr. Waters addressed that. But um, I think, again, I would start off with, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not a proponent for splitting up homes necessarily. So I don't, uh, I don't think that people necessarily need to live apart, uh, because that has been sometimes the concern of whether partners need to live apart. Um, and I think, again, it comes down to all of the things that you would do, even if you were living on your own. So uh, potentially, uh, so in terms of um, hand hygiene, when you get home, changing, taking the clothes that you wore to work, putting it in the laundromat, um, and then changing it to house clothes. And, um, and then uh, I think, and then if, let's say, somebody were to develop symptoms, then it's the full quarantine for the 14 days. Yeah, I, I I agree with um, with that uh, with Ranjani's um, comment. It's we don't want to be sp um, splitting up families, and it's just the hand hygiene, the social distancing, and uh, it's it's even having hand uh, sanitizer in the car. So when you're fin finishing from work, you're washing your hands straight away from from there, and then the change of clothes and sh and showering when you when you get in. And hopefully banks have them too, because money is dirty. Mm. I think it's called money laundering, Ranjani. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, indeed. Uh, so it, one of the things that came up recently as well, and, and I think there's conflicting information and maybe evolving information and advice is around the use of masks. And so people are asking, should people with CF wear masks? Should they not? If they should, what types? Uh, perhaps you could comment on the latest thinking uh, from the medical community around that. Sure. I mean, I think this is a question uh, that probably could be discussed on its own for two hours. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know that there's a perfect answer, but I think like with everything else in the COVID pandemic, things have been dynamic and changing and evolving over time. Um, again, I think uh, I want to emphasize that people living with cystic fibrosis are already excellent at a lot of the basic things that keep them safe in communities. And I think the use of masks uh, certainly can play a role depending on the scenario. Um, I think there's conflicting data because of the studies itself, but also just, I think it also depends on where are you using the mask? What is the population density? What is the closeness of contact? Are you touching your face when you're using the mask? Are you using proper hand hygiene? And I think all of those factors play into it. And um, I think the use of masks has sort of uh, increased and the recommendations have changed to use of masks as we understand more that COVID-19 can be passed potentially between people that don't have symptoms. So either asymptomatic, which means that they never develop symptoms, or pre-symptomatic, which means that they might go on to develop symptoms, in which case they might transmit the virus one to three days before they develop symptoms. And so that means that it can be passed through speech, whether it's as droplets or fomites, so meaning that your spit lands on a surface, uh, or you touch your face. When you're talking, you touch a surface, then somebody else touches that surface, touches their face, and transmits the virus that way. Uh, so I think those are sort of the, that's led to the evolution and, and um, the recommendation to use masks. I think, uh, I think in general, um, for the first time, really everybody is asked to socially isolate, socially distance. And so I think if you're doing a lot of that, you probably, you don't need masks in your home. I think if you're going to a public place, um, I think that is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, again, it comes down to your uh, perception of risk. How much risk are you willing to take? Are you able to actually socially distance? If you're going into a busy grocery store and you can't distance, um, you can wear a mask. Again, masks aren't really meant to protect you, but protect others from the droplets. Um, so I think it really is a yes or no, depending on your perception of risk. 
Yeah, I echo those uh, those uh, comments. Um, I think the big thing which is important is that it's preventing the spread of droplets. And I think the um, the main thing is that people don't need to have medical grade masks to do that because they're needed for the healthcare uh, professionals and frontline workers. And so there are ways of making uh, homemade masks. There's uh, several YouTube videos which are out there which uh, can you can generate a, a cloth based mask. But again, it's weighing up the risks and the and the benefits at home, as as, as Ranjani says. There's no need. But if you go into the grocery store where you will, you can't guarantee that uh, two meter distance, um, then a mask may be appropriate there. But again, it's also the hand hygiene, because if you're uh, touching the mask to readjust it, if you touch something in the grocery store and then transmit it to your to your face. Thank you both. Lots of questions still coming in around um, having to venture out to grocery stores, pharmacies, that sort of thing. Uh, we touched on that uh, quite a bit last week in terms of protocols, uh, but um, one of the questions that came in recently was around whether or not people with CF should try to avail themselves of limited um, hours. So I know, for example, some grocery stores have limited or designated certain hours at the beginning of the day, for example, for seniors or people who uh, have been identified as being higher risk. Uh, is, would it be best for someone living with CF to try to avail themselves uh, of that, of that um, uh, opportunity? Or some of the thinking from some people might be that that's why, why introduce yourself to more people who might be more compromised at that time during those uh, times that are designated for people with, within those populations. So do you have any advice in terms of how people should approach this when they're having to go out and pick up groceries and medicine and other essential items? I, th I think the, this is an interesting question uh, with that and having seen the lineups for grocery stores um, going in there, it, it, it is uh, challenging. And I think they, it's also to look uh, slightly differently in terms of there's some of the grocery stores are offering click and collect. So you can place your online order. You can then drive up and to a designated area and get uh, the shopping put into the, into the trunk of the car. Others are doing online delivery. And so I think if we're looking at social distancing, trying to use that with the, uh, for those things would be of, of use. And I think also, some of the pharmacies that are also doing delivery as, as well, if I, if I remember correctly. I've looked at the guidance in terms of like um, Superstore and what they're doing, and it, it seems to be with the elderly population uh, for, for the most part. Um, but it's, as I say, it's, it's a challenge. And they've also recommended going at quiet times of the day. So certainly first things in the morning, there's a, a big lineup um, to, uh, where there's people wanting to get supplies, but, but towards the end of the evening, just before shutting, then there's less people coming through and less lineups as well. So it's trying to judge your time so that if you do have to go out is to uh, go to those stores and also to see if you've got anyone else, either in the family or neighbors who may be able to pick things up for you if it's a refill on a, on a medication. Uh, I agree with um, everything that Mark has said. I, I, I think that we also have to, um, make decisions based on the current data that we have as well. And so I think certainly people living with cystic fibrosis are at potentially an increased risk, but so far from what we're seeing, uh, and again, I think much can be uh, attributed to the fact that people with cystic fibrosis know how to keep themselves safe, but on the flip side of it, we haven't seen uh, the really the risk for bad outcomes has been in people who are older. And so I think, um, with using all of the grocery store uh, options, choosing off hours to go, and then again, practicing that social distancing, hand hygiene, uh, potentially wiping down the grocery boxes when you get home. Uh, I think those are probably sufficient um, to be safe. And then the other thing again, is just shopping as you need. So maybe getting groceries for one or two weeks at a time, having a family member that doesn't have cystic fibrosis, if that's an option or a friend, uh, to get them for you. Again, if you're feeling nervous, um, can, uh, can also uh, help with that. Thanks. And, and for those that are just joining us or just joined us over the last few minutes, uh, we are offering today's session uh, featuring Dr. Ranjani Somayaji and Dr. Mark Chilvers, two of the outstanding CF clinicians that we work with across the country. 
who are uh, entertaining questions and providing information for you regarding COVID-19. Uh, I'm Jeff Beach with Cystic Fibrosis Canada and my colleagues and I are very pleased to be able to offer this information series to you, which is part of the broader information um, library, if you will, that we're building uh, continuously around COVID-19 for the CF community, which is available on our website, cysticfibrosis.ca. So I would encourage you to uh, avail yourself of the information and resources that uh, we have posted and are continually posting day by day as things evolve. Also, please keep the questions coming in. This is a series and we're entertaining questions uh, live today as, in as much as possible. Uh, we will be offering future uh, webinars of this nature as well to address questions that are coming in continuously. So please uh, check out those resources and keep those uh, questions coming. Um, so a few uh, specific questions that have come in uh, today. We did have a question last week um, uh, uh, with someone who um, uh, is pregnant and the concern around uh, the person with CF going into the delivery room to be there with uh, his wife. Uh, this one is um, uh, a, a bit different uh, in, in it's more around uh, they've already decided that um, the, the, the situation is that the, the person who's pregnant and her husband has cystic fibrosis. Um, he has already said that he's not going to the hospital and they've made that decision. But uh, her question is, should she and the baby isolate when they come home? And if so, for how long should that be? Um, so, I mean, that's a good question. I think that, you know, hospitals, uh, again, to sort of echo some sentiments from last week's session, hospitals are often seen as uh, dangerous and a cesspool of COVID-19. And I think that's um, not true. Uh, I think there are a lot of protocols in place uh, to triage people accordingly, including single point of care entries in most hospitals, people getting their symptoms checked. And so I think and even in the obstetric suites, a lot of things have been done for infection prevention and control. Um, so I don't think that there is a need in the absence of symptoms or an absence of exposure to somebody specifically with COVID that there's a need to specifically quarantine after coming home. Um, with that said, I mean, I think some of these terms isolation, quarantine, distancing are sort of used synonymously and, and can probably be confusing as well. Uh, I think that in general, even when you come home, you as a family unit will be socially distancing or isolating from everyone else anyways. And so in that sense, uh, can monitor for any symptoms, um, can get medical care as needed, and can talk to your clinic provider as well if, if you have any concerns in that time frame. Yeah, I, I agree agree with uh, Ranjani and I think the other thing too is I, I wouldn't be recommending socially isolating at home uh, because at the end of the day people have been already socially isolating for now so you're going in for the delivery so the risk of uh, anybody having COVID within that family unit is low. The hospitals are very good at screening now and uh, they're very good at implementing social distancing within the, with the hospital and particularly in high-risk areas such as maternity wards. And I think the other thing which is also encouraging in terms of, out of uh, data out of China, when there was pregnant mums who had COVID-19 and they gave birth to their babies, they may, the baby may get the COVID-19, but it was a very mild infection. It didn't seem to have a significant impact, if any, on the baby. So I think for, from that, given the fact that everyone is healthy, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, socially isolating when you return home from having given birth. And whoever it is, good luck and I hope it goes well. Thank you. Uh, some questions have also come in around um, daily treatment uh, regimens and whether or not anything should be done differently, anything should be adjusted or any other extra precautions should be taken beyond the obvious uh, ones that we're all talking about around hand washing and so forth. But uh, for people who uh, live with cystic fibrosis who are involved in, in various um, daily treatment regimens to maintain their health. Is, do you have any advice for them in terms of whether they should continue business as usual or whether they should look at doing things maybe a little bit differently? Jeff, you've given me free reign to lecture people to do more <laughs> physiotherapy at home. Um, you know, I think that probably from all of our uh, standpoints as a clinic, we are doing our best to provide care for all the people that we take care of, but also uh, to minimize any healthcare exposures. And so I think to that end, I think it is helpful if 
people uh, make sure that they are doing their physiotherapy and airway clearance and therapies at home every day because again anything to minimize getting sick and needing hospital care will be helpful um, so even if let's say they're ex experiencing slightly increased symptoms uh, you know i would suggest upping the physiotherapy sort of like what you would get in a hospital especially because nowadays when people are admitted to hospitals we are trying to minimize procedures that generate aerosols in most cases so it ends up that patients have to do their own physiotherapy or airway clearance um, to minimize the aerosols generated and in which case they're almost better off as much as possible to try to do that at home so increase the physiotherapy to two or three times a day if you're feeling any symptoms um, often we can be, uh, we can treat you with oral antibiotics at home to try, again, try to keep you at home. So do all the therapies. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's amazing all my patients are actually managing to get all the therapies in now that they're not going to, to school. And I think the, the big thing is about the aerosol generating particles when you're doing the nebulization and or uh, physiotherapy. And so I think the, for, Obviously for children, they need the supervision to, to do that. So we'll need a care to, um, provider uh, with them. But for older patients, it may be a few within the family unit is to do it in a separate room and then to wipe down the, the nebulizer and the, and the PEP device um, after use uh, to, with that, just to minimize any risk of any spread, particularly if you're sick at that time. But if you're not, then just keep doing that PEP. Thank you for that advice. We're also getting a lot of questions related to employment. Um, so along a couple of different themes. So one of them being financial supports that are available who's, uh, for people whose employment has been affected by COVID-19 and uh, people who have lost their jobs. So uh, there is information obviously uh, available from a wide number of sources. We have uh, tried to collate some of that information around the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, for example, if you check our website, again, cysticfibrosis.ca, under the COVID-19 section, which is the first thing you'll see when you uh, hit our landing page, you will see um, information and some links to uh, information that would be helpful for those that are looking um, to avail themselves of these types of supports. Um, for those who are, um, uh, are working and have cystic fibrosis, uh, there are some questions that have come in, and I, I'm going to try to reiterate these. Uh, one of them was, was very specific, and, uh, but the, really they're around um, the challenges uh, when an employer has essentially declared that someone um, needs to be working, is considered an essential worker for whatever reason, uh, but they, this person has cystic fibrosis, obviously is of heightened concern uh, because of COVID-19, and um, doesn't want to use their sick leave time uh, benefits. Uh, because they might need them. They, these are often, uh, both examples I think are people who use their sick time obviously when they need it. And so uh, for people like that, do you have any advice on other options that might be available in terms of how people could approach their employers to try to work out a solution that would uh, prevent them from having to use their sick time when they're really not sick right now? Mark, do you want to start or? Yeah, that's it. That's a challenging question, and I, I I feel for those uh, those individuals who are in in that situation, and I think the it's an interesting um, scenario because the it's looking to see whether you can do virtual work from home and see whether there's an opportunity to 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 do that. Uh, we'll, be one thought with um, the other thing would be worth, maybe worthwhile contacting their their local clinic to see if they have any specific advice and the reason why I, I, I say that in terms of we've got had some parents who've uh, contacted the clinic to see if we could write letters to say that they shouldn't work because of their child has cystic fibrosis and we've actually done that on a, uh, there's no guidance from public health or uh, from, the, the, from the hospitals within, within BC. So we've done that on a in individualized basis. So if you've got somebody who's got um, really bad, their child has got really bad lung function, and that if they were to get sick, it would result in a hospital admission, then we've written a letter to support that 
a parent not working, or if they were on high dose steroids for uh, an immune uh, suppressed on that. So that's where we've we've addressed the the work issue, but I think it it's it's a real challenge, and uh, I think we've just got to go back to the to the basics. The data that we know for patients with cystic fibrosis tends to be a milder disease uh, from what we're aware of at the moment. It's not like if they had had a lung transplant or on heavy immunosuppression, where if they could get a viral infection, could have a detriment to their to their health. And I think we know from the data coming through from Canada that um, that social distancing and hand washing is having an impact on preventing the spread of the the disease and starting to to flatten the curve. So it's again, it goes back to what Renjani was saying: is it's it's weighing up the risk uh, with that. And unfortunately, these things, they do change from week to week. But at this moment in time, uh, that would be my advice. I don't know if you have any other comments, Ranjani. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, um, these are challenging situations for people with or without cystic fibrosis as well. I think many people are facing employment challenges. And so it's about sort of taking that in context. But um, again, we need money and other things to live, have a home, etc. And so it's about balancing those as well. I think. One of the things is that many uh, workplaces have potentially moved a lot of non-essential people to work from home already. And so even if you're having to go to work, it might be that you actually have less people that you're working around. And in that sense, you're able to distance better as well. And so sometimes those workplace accommodations, just by the fact that people have either let go of people or made people work remotely um, have already sort of occurred, which do help along with it. Um, again, I think using all those basic principles helps um, and uh, clinics, um, I mean, I know in Calgary, we've written employment letters, uh, not necessarily to say that they absolutely can't work, but um, just to say if there are ways to accommodate even partially working from home, they can do that. I think, again, employers themselves are balancing uh, their own uh, contracts and issues with insurance companies and how insurance companies are going to pay this out. So I think it's sort of a challenge at a global level, really. Absolutely, and, and both of you mentioned um, seeking, uh, if you have specific situations, seeking help and advice from your, uh, your clinic. And I wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone that we have built a COVID-19 clinic uh, guide, if you will, on our, on our website in the COVID-19 section as well. We have information that's been compiled from all of the CF clinics across the country. And I know Ian, who I'm looking at on the, the, the screen right now has been working really hard to connect with uh, the clinics right across the country and uh, has uh, been compiling some great information around the clinics and how they're impacted and how to get a hold of people during this time when clinic hours are not operating as normal and, and so forth. So please make sure as you're reaching out to the clinic that you do check that information that's available and again, continuously being updated on our website as well. We have had some questions coming in uh, recently and uh, lots of information um, circulating, I guess, in the public now around uh, access to ventilators. And so uh, the question I think really in general is, that people with cystic fibrosis uh, within the community are expressing concern about access to ventilators if uh, this, uh, if it, the situation presents itself where that would be required during the pandemic. Um, so is there, do you have any, either of you have any information around uh, your own uh, provincial uh, policies around ventilator access and anything that might be helpful for people listening in from the CF community? So, um, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. So from uh, BC, the, uh, there has been a reduction in all hospital activity to create uh, additional uh, beds and ICU capacity uh, there. And from what my understanding is the, when we're looking at the number of new cases and the patients who are ad admitted into hospital, the ventilator capacity currently is, um, is is available and there's a, there is a significant uh, bed availability within within BC. In addition, they're building uh, some the field hospital uh, to take some of the milder COVID-19 cases. So I believe certainly in BC that there's been a lot of planning going through that. And I do believe that it's in a position that it will be able to manage that need if should that need arise. Um, and obviously the whole 
purpose of the social distancing is to relieve the pressure on the healthcare services should that speak come at the, at the peak comes so it's all about flattening the curve um, with the social distancing and the hand hygiene and uh, yeah I, I do certainly with the BC data which is comes up, comes out it's starting to see an impact and it's one of those things people can't relax they've still got to continue with this and we need to uh, um, uh, monitor very closely I agree. And I think just speaking for Alberta, I mean, uh, again, I think at all health authorities, at least across Canada, are doing a lot of behind the scenes work for planning and increasing capacity, including ventilators. Um, and again, I think I um, would just say that all of you living with cystic fibrosis are doing a great job in that we're not seeing very many cases across the world. And the cases that we have seen have been mild. Um, and so it's about continuing to do what you're already doing well. Thank you. And uh, just to, to let everyone know that the um, ventilator issue is one that we are working on compiling information. Uh, we expect to have a province by province analysis of um, access to ventilator policies that will be available uh, by early next week on the COVID-19 section of our website and uh, we'll continue to monitor that situation and populate that information it, and it becomes available. A uh, question that, uh, that just came in um, re regarding um, access to ventilator, to a ventilator uh, is how would having CF impact the triaging as to whether someone would be given access or not to a ventilator? I mean, I think at this point, um, any patient coming into hospital with COVID is going to be given the maximum care needed. Um, and so I don't think that we are at that point yet of having to triage, which is great. And I think, again, it's about encouraging all of you to continue with social distancing, uh, not only those of you living with cystic fibrosis, but all of us as well, so that we can't, we don't ever have to make those decisions as a health system. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely uh, with that. And again, it's, it's just, I, I know we keep emphasizing this point, uh, but it seems from the data that in cystic fibrosis, the disease may be mild, so you may not need um, to a, a, that intensive care support. Um, yeah. But it, it is, and I can, uh, I can understand the concern within the community about the triaging, but thankfully, given the measures that we're uh, undertaking, where the healthcare resources are, are currently available. Thank you both. Uh, we, we touched a bit last week on um, those who um, have uh, had a transplant uh, and whether or not um, there are certain, again, additional protocols that people should be taking. I think that was addressed during last week's call. Mm -hmm. Question that came in today was, uh, do we know at this point, are you aware of anyone who's had a transplant, uh, who's had COVID, been diagnosed with co having COVID-19, and, and is there any um, information around how they're doing, if, if you're aware of anyone? Okay. Um, certainly, I mean, I think, uh, as probably many of you would surmise, uh, having a transplant, so lung transplant being the most common, uh, whether you have cystic fibrosis or not outside of that, potentially increases the risk because the immune system is suppressed. Um, in talking to my colleagues in the US, they did have one case of a person who had a lung transplant with CF um, who did get COVID infection, but uh, was very mild and did not need hospitalization. Thank you. And I, I think in terms of your second part of your question, Jeff, in terms of do they need to be doing anything else? I think again, uh, it's doing all of the same things and being cautious as they normally would. And I think, again, people living with cystic fibrosis already know how to be cautious. And then after the transplant, you get extra education on how to be cautious from a transplant point of view. Um, so you still would take all of your normal medications, touch base with your transplant and or CF clinical team and continue with your usual routines. Thanks, Mark. Anything to add to that? 
Uh, no, it's, I think that's uh, reasonable. And I think some of the transplant programs have put recommendations uh, for, the, for those patients as well. So contact your transplant team, uh, certainly in BC, that the recommendations of what to do with um, if you had a transplant or, and done uh, immunosuppression. Thank you. Uh, one of the issues that uh, we're, we're hearing people raise and, and um, questions that are coming in are around uh, additional mental health uh, supports that, that may be available to people um, living with cystic fibrosis who are under uh, a, a more um, pressure from a mental health standpoint than, than normal. Um, is there anything that you would advise people? And, we, and I will preface this by saying we are working on the next iteration of our Q&A session and, and we're planning to address more of those questions there. But uh, while we have the two of you with us today, is there anything that you would advise or you have advised to your patients around availing themselves of uh, mental health support if they feel that they need additional support during this time? The, with, I think the uh, families and patients need to remember that the CF team is always there just because the hospitals have reduced activity there's always somebody on the end of the phone within the, the CF clinic who can put them in direction for local supports for uh, mental health and emotional wellness certainly from uh, our clinic we've in our um, COVID letter we've given re uh, links to resources for emotional wellness and for mental health support um, for families, because it, it, there's a lot of anxiety in the uh, the population as a whole. But when you have an additional uh, factor such as cystic fibrosis, I can imagine that anxiety is is very much uh, elevated. I, I echo Mark's sentiment. I think the clinic team is available. We our clinic psychiatrist has reached out by phone to um, several patients um, relating to their mental health needs as well. And again, I think this is going to be a challenging time for all of us uh, in terms of how does social isolation affect our lives and as well as all the other changes. And I think uh, it will also, in addition to the available supports um, for people living with cystic fibrosis, I think we'll also have to be creative and think outside of the box of how, how we can approach uh, potential mental health issues as we move forward as well. Absolutely. Uh, I wanna take this opportunity to um, put out a, a call if there are any additional questions. Uh, Ian and I have been um, sort of monitoring things as uh, questions have come in. We've had a few things that have been fed to us through our communications team, through social media as well. Uh, but I, I don't think at this point in time we have any specific questions that we haven't been able to address. Uh, so if anyone has any, please send them in through the chat uh, panel now. Uh, while I give people a few minutes if they wish to do that, I will remind everyone again that this is part of a series of Q&A Ask the Expert sessions like this one. This is the second of our series and we are uh, recording these uh, sessions and they are available. The first one from last Wednesday is available on our website in the COVID-19 section. And uh, this one will be available shortly, uh, I believe by the end of day today. Devin, is that correct? Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Yep, that's uh, that's correct. It'll be ready. It'll be ready in the next couple of hours to send out. Perfect. Thank you. And so we'll share that through our social media channels, and we will have it live on, uh, if you will, as a resource for people with CF um, to uh, to to rewatch or to uh, avail themselves of if they weren't able to join us live today. Uh, for those of you that have joined us live today, I want to thank you for joining us. And we do have a. Um, Okay, we do have another question coming in. Sorry, I'm just looking at my text messages here. Uh, so uh, complications uh, such as CF related diabetes. Um, is there anything, any comment on any, any additional um, pro precautions or protocols if someone is, is dealing with a uh, complication like CF related diabetes? I think, I mean, one of, when we're looking at, um outcomes relating to COVID-19. A uh, few of the signals have been older age, uh, as well as some comorbidities like diabetes, and that's not specific to CF-related diabetes. And so, I mean, one could hypothesize that someone living with cystic fibrosis that has more advanced lung disease, as well as complications, may be at more risk than someone who has milder lung disease and none of those complications. But I think in terms of 
your day to day and what you do, uh, I think it's essentially the same. And so keeping up with your medications, keeping your sugars under control, doing your airway clearance, doing your physiotherapies, um, social distancing, hand hygiene, and so forth. Yeah, I agree with that. It's the, we don't have the data to see whether there's anything specific for patients with cystic fibrosis and CF related diabetes should do anything different. As I say, the numbers are, are very low. Okay, thank you. Another question that's just come in uh, is from someone asking about potential risks to supply chain for uh, medical, um, the, the medical uh, supply chain. And if you're aware of any um, discussions around that or any particular risks that have been identified within the medical community? Um, that's a great question. I think uh, there has been planning again at a systems level and a pharmacy level and so I, I think at least for Calgary or probably Alberta um, specific pharmacies have been asked to dispense medications at one month at a time versus three just to ensure that there is supply and uh, then they can obtain more medications accordingly. I don't think there's been shortages as of yet. Um, in terms of trial medications, I think I saw, uh, again, those, those people that are already on a medication um, haven't had issues. Uh, for new trials, those probably will be stopped until um, we are further along through this. And I think in terms of your specific medications, if there's ever any concern, I think the best thing is to talk to your local clinic and uh, the, the clinic pharmacist and team can uh, generally help with that. Yeah, uh, that would be my recommendation. I'm not aware of any supply issues. I think the I'm guided from the federal government is what they're, they're saying. And I think they've been the, the daily broadcast from the prime minister is very useful to say it's what they're doing. And certainly that's one of the things with like, for example, the ventilators, they're looking at gen, uh, building um, 30,000 ventilators for the, the provinces. And then they're going to put those into the provinces which are at most in need. Great. Thank you both. We have we've had another question submitted uh, today. Uh, from a, uh, a mom who has a, a son with cystic fibrosis and uh, who is she is breastfeeding uh, and uh, so she's asking if she were to develop symptoms would she need to self-isolate and she added uh, that they are the family is practicing social distancing but her husband is a frontline worker so there's some concern around that as well. I can imagine that must be a little worried um, for sure. I think that's a really good question and it's a real challenging uh, question to, to answer. And I think there's probably two parts uh, to that. One is, is there any evidence for COVID-19 being transmitted in breast milk if you get infected with that? And then the second one is um, the droplet uh, thing or breathing when you're feeding the, the baby. And it's, it's weighing up the risks of, of, of transmission and I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, the, I think my, just thinking it through, one thing is obviously we're doing hand hygiene. We've talked a little bit about um, droplet spread and so if you, are, if you were to get sick and you were breastfeeding, then I think a mask would be an appropriate thing to, to, to use at that point as well as doing the, the, the hand hygiene. Uh, and obviously you could do change of clothes or having a, a, a blanket over that which you can then move. But it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I think going back and then as to the message we've been giving all today is that the in CF, from what we are led to believe and, in, in, and particularly in children, that the illness is mild and a lot of children will have COVID-19 and be completely asymptomatic and that's why some of the transmission is through children. So I think with those in, in mind, I think I would certainly breastfeeding is, um, is appropriate and is you you minimize the risk to the baby with that and johnny do you have anything to add on that from well I'll, I'll have a disclaimer saying i'm an adult doctor but i think i mean i agree with everything that you've said i mean we certainly don't have data on it and hopefully we'd never get enough data on it um, to have evidence for it but i think the other thing to keep in mind is that um we also sort of counsel everyone that household units are essentially considered infected for the most part if one person is and that you're exposed to that member and so chances are if you as a mom develop symptoms outside of doing all of these things that you would typically do 
for any viral infection, really, if you were coughing and and had a runny nose, you might wear a mask or, and um, use extra hand hygiene, use um, a blanket, et cetera. Um, probably that baby has already been exposed because again, there can be that pre-symptomatic transmission for a few days even before you develop symptoms. So I think again, um, most likely to be mild and I don't think we have enough data to say it, do not breastfeed at all. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, submitted some really good questions coming in today. And as I said earlier, we would encourage you to continue to submit them. We are uh, getting close to being up against the clock here. So I think we're going to start to wrap up. I'll just ask uh, both of you, Mark and, and Johnny, if you have any, uh, any other questions or, or anything else you'd like to share with those who have joined us today or those who may be watching the recording afterwards before we close off. I think uh, I've really have appreciated the opportunity to speak with the community today. I think uh, a lot of the time there's anxiety and so being able to deal with questions and coming to questions which are troubling the, the CF community is, is really important. And uh, I'd refer uh, thanks to CF Canada for the huge effort they're doing to allay that anxiety with the resource that you put on the, the website. I think the, my take home message from me um, personally is we're going to get through this we're going to uh, get through this and we're going to learn from this and there'll be some positive changes to the clinic operations I think <clears throat> come out of this and yeah it's uh, we've just got to hang in there with the basics which are in place are working and we just need to continue to do with the social distancing and the hand washing thanks Jeff um, I, I, again, echo the same sentiments. Thank you to CF Canada for putting on these webinars. And I think it's a nice way for the community to come together, ask the questions. And I think um, probably if one person has a qu this question, many of you might have the same questions, fears and anxieties. And so it's another way to say we're actually all in this together. Um, I think even looking outside of the cystic fibrosis community, I think the world is in this together. And so I think uh, we're going to have to work together and we're going to get through it together. And, come out better and stronger um, in many ways on the other end. Uh, so, it, and I think in terms of those of you living with cystic fibrosis, you're already ahead of the curve. You've been doing much of this, um, the social distancing, the hand hygiene, and all of those good things for much, if not most, or all of your lives. Um, so it's actually, you can be the role models for these behaviors to the entire world. So um, keep doing what you're doing. Very well said, both of you. Thank you. Uh, just reminding everyone that this is part of a series and we will continue to offer these opportunities for uh, the community to interact uh, and, and submit questions for experts uh, like Dr. Chilvers and Dr. Somayaji who joined us today. Uh, we will be offering a, another session a week from today as well, so stay tuned for details on that. We're also working with our Quebec team on a uh, French language Q&A session that we hope to announce very shortly. I was um, trading some emails right up until the time we dialed in today with uh, Olivier from our Quebec office. Uh, he's just working on finalizing some details, but we expect to announce that very soon uh, so that people from the Francophone community can avail themselves of a similar opportunity. Um, so I will just close by saying thank you, uh, of course, to our experts, uh, Mark and uh, Ranjani for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Your, um, uh, we know that you're stretched as uh, everyone working in healthcare is right now. So to take this hour out of your schedule really means a lot to us and certainly to the community. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues for helping to organize this session and collating the questions and getting us prepared. And finally, uh, for all of you who submitted questions and those who joined uh, this session and the last one and will continue to, we really do appreciate it. And, and along the lines of what uh, both Ranjani and Mark said, uh, we will get through this and we are in this together and we're here to help in any way you can, any way we can rather. So please continue to submit your questions, contact us offline if you choose to do so, and we'll continue to be in touch with you as well. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.